Okay, well, thanks, Jim. Um, so hopefully, I didn't. The title doesn't scare too many people away. Um, I see that we have a we have a couple dozen people on the line, um, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep the math minimal. Um, I was talking to Jim a few minutes ago and say, you know, that you can very easily get lost in the math um, with some of this. So I'm gonna try to keep it, you know, fairly high level and at least just just try to convey um, the overall concepts. Um, so. Um, one of the things that we've been working on in the in the forensic subcommittee is, you know, is, is there a way that we can um, estimate wind speeds um, using, um, you know, probability distributions, you know, and, and get some kind of, you know, kind of bounds or estimate of, of wind speeds um, at, at, at a given, you know, site or building um, that's experienced, you know, tornadoes. Um, or other types of wind speeds. Is there a way that we can estimate, you know, based on the failures that we're seeing, uh, what kind of wind speeds um, might 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 have a, might have actually caused that? Um, so I'm going to go over just some, you know, a few definitions uh, to start with, um, and then get into a little bit of, of reliability theory um, and, and how we're using that um, as uh, as a method to to estimate these wind speeds. Um, and then I'll talk about, you know, the resistances um, and the distributions that we're using for for different structural components, um, and then talk about the wind load uncertainties and and, and how we're accounting for that. <clears throat> so uh, to start out with, um, I just wanted to talk briefly about what failure means, um, right? I mean, this is something that, that that can mean you know different things to different people, right? A very generic definition is you know the 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 component or the building cannot perform its intended function, right? Then, then that you know th that that could mean that there's failure, right? But failure could be represented in multiple different ways, right? I, I have a couple different um, samples here. So on the left, right, if we just have like a just a simple beam, and we apply some kind of load in the middle of it, right? That that beam is going to deflect under that load, right? And if that load you know, most of the time, you know, we apply a load, right, and we take the load off and the beam, you know, it springs back up to where it was before. Um, however, um, you know, one failure mode could be that, you know, that there's a permanent uh, uh, deflection in that beam, right? So we call a plastic hinge uh, that develops, right? And and so the beam will sag, right? That that could be a failure mode. Um, another failure mode, you know, if you're, if you're talking about loading a beam, could be, you know, loss of lateral stability, right? Maybe the beam, you know, falls over because it, it doesn't have enough lateral stability um, um, to hold that. Or you could have, you know, if, if say if you had like a steel eye section here, um, you could have some local buckling of say the top flange or maybe the web um, in, in the middle, right? And that, that could be another form of failure. Um, the, the, the pictures here on the right are um, some pictures that I, that from some testing that I did when I was in grad school, uh, testing, you know, the pressure resistance of, of, of OSB plywood for on, on a roof. Um, and you can see, you know, there are several different uh, failure modes here, right? So that you know, these are, these are just nails that are nailed through that into the two by four here. You know, some of these, you know, there, there was full nail withdrawal. Others, the nail stayed in the two by four and the head pulled through the uh, the the OSB. Others, there was just partial nail withdrawal. Right, you could have the two by four break, um, and so forth. Right, so there, there there's multiple ways that failure can happen. Right, and and sometimes you know it, it's very useful to define what what failure is um, as we as we go through you know this process of of estimating wind speeds and 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 looking at the damage um, to a given building. <clears throat> okay, so the next uh, um, topic I want to introduce is called a limit state. Okay, so this is something that that's used in reliability theory. Um, and a limit state is essentially just a boundary between a desired and an undesired performance, um, right? So, you know, so, it, so you know, it's, it kind of goes back to failure, right? You know, the limit state would be, you know, what, what is considered failure, um, right? And there's something we call an ultimate limit state, which is, you know, again, the failure, it's the loss of the load carrying capacity of, 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 of whatever we're looking at. So, um, it's often, you know, represented, it, represented as, um, as a limit state function. Right, and, and just very, very simply here, you know, R minus L, so resistance minus the load, right, or capacity minus the demand, right, and so um, the limit state then would be when, 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 when the resistance minus the load is equal to zero, right, that's when you're kind of in that equilibrium, right, if your resistance is higher than your load, 
then that means that your limit state function is greater than zero, right? And that means that you're safe because you, you, your, your capacity to withstand that load is greater than the demand or load placed on it, right? And if, but, if it's, but if it's flipped, right, if, if the load is, is, is greater than the capacity, then, that's, then that's, a, that's the undesired performance, right? And so the structure, you know, would, would fail in, in that instance. <clears throat> okay, and we can take that, um, um, that, um, that limit state and we can relate it to a probability of failure, right? So the probability of failure is just defined as the probability that the undesired performance will occur, right? So that's the, you know, the, the, the probability that your load or your demand is greater than your resistance or the, or the capacity, okay? And so, um, you know, but in this, you know, both the load and the resistance uh, you know the re resistance of an individual component, building component, and the load um, are are random variables, right? And there's some you know distribution associated with those. Um, and so you know the the probability of failure then um, is defined as the overlap of the load and resistance, right? So on the, you have the load on the on the left side here and the resistance distribution on the right, right? And that overlap area, it, you, know, you, you integrate over this area and that is your equal to your probability of failure, right? So, you know, so a, as your distributions, you know, of course, you know, move apart, the probability of failure decreases as they as they are closer together, you know, the means uh, come closer together than, than the probability of failure uh, increases, okay? Uh, now, it, it Using, you know, th this is a very simple, you know, concept, but, you know, but it can be quite difficult, um, you know, to actually calculate the, the probability of failure directly. Um, you know, so a lot of, a lot of times, um, you know, people do Monte Carlo simulations. That, that's a very common way, um, you know, to, to estimate these probabilities of failure where you can put in, you know, the, 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 the distributions directly in a Monte Carlo simulation and do that. Um, however, um, for, for this, we're looking for more of a closed form uh, solution. Okay, so so one of the things that uh, that we do that makes this easier for us um, is we look at, at at the reduced variables, right? So this is the, you know a, a not the non-dimensional form um, of both the load and resistance. Um, so you know so we can represent those. You know they're represented here by by z, right? Again, so you know that the r is resistance and and the l is the load, right? So we have the the resistance minus the mean of that distribution divided by the standard deviation of that distribution, right? So th this is the reduced variable, reduced variable um, uh, form of that. So if, if we, we can write the limit state function then as, as the function of these, of these reduced variables, okay? Um, and we end up with something that, that actually represents a straight line um, in the reduced variate space. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, so, you know, again, the, 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 the line of interest is when our limit state function is equal to zero, right? And again, you know, if, the, um, if it's less than or equal to zero, um, um, you know, we're, we have failure, and if it's greater than, if it's less than zero, we have failure, if it's greater than or equal to zero, then we're safe. Um, and so, you know, so, it's, so if we have that line, right, we can represent that by these, you know, these points are the reduced variates, um, essentially, or, or some form of the, uh, of those reduced variates. Um, and, 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 and one way that we, that we represent then, you know, how, um, you know, how good we are is what is, is something that we call the reliability index, which is the shortest distance from the origin in the in this reduced space to that to that uh, to that limit state line, right? And so it, you know it's the shortest distance, you know, so it forms a right angle uh, with that line. Um, and so this is you know you know uh, uh, mathematically, this physically, this is what this represents, right? So it it, it makes it makes it, uh, it it makes it uh, easier for us to calculate whether or not you know we're in the safe zone or whether we're in the failure zone. Okay, and this reliability index we can relate directly back to. Um, the probability of failure. Okay, but but before I get there, real quick, you know, so, so this reliability index beta um, can be, you know, for distributed, uncorrelated, random uh, variables. Uh, we can represent it uh, by the, you know, the mean of the resistance minus the mean of the load divided by the sum of their, uh, the square root of the sum of their variances. Okay, um, but <clears throat> and we can, but we can relate this directly back to a probability of failure. Then, um, so. The reliability index here is, is the negative of the inverse of the standard normal cumulative distribution of the probability of failure, right? Or the probability of failure is equal to the standard normal cumulative distribution of the negative reliability index, okay? So, the, so we, we can relate those two um, uh, directly. <clears throat> 
and so you know so the, the the chart here below just shows kind of what that looks like how the probability of failure and the reliability index relate right you know so as you know if we have reliability indexes you know on the order of say three right that corresponds to a probability of failure of of one e to the minus three right um or you know if we have reliability index of you know five we're approaching one e to the minus seven right so these are you know very very small probabilities of failure lead to larger um uh, reliability indexes okay we can also uh, relate the you know th th those are for normally distributed right that the, the equation i showed before uh, we can convert that if if we consider that the resistances and the loads are log normally distributed Right. I mean, a lot of um, uh, resistance distributions for various building components uh, can be represented uh, quite well by a log normal distribution. And so that's that, that's very commonly used. Um, and so, you know, so this is what the the uh, the reliability index looks like then um, for a log normally distributed uh, uh, random variables. Whereas it's a little more complicated, right, where, where we introduce then also the, the coefficient of variation of both the resistance um, and the load. Right. I, 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 I won't go through the full derivation of this, but this this is what that uh, um, that looks like. <clears throat> okay, so so I want to step back then and go back and talk briefly about a couple things that Bill talked about last week when he was talking about the wind loads, um, right? And then and then I'll, I'll come back here and, and a couple slides and and tie the, the the reliability index and the probability of failure back into it, um, right? So. So we have this this generic equation, uh, very standard equation out of ASCE 7 um, to express and, and calculate what are the design wind loads on a structure, uh, right? Where you know we have a you know the velocity squared. Uh, we have these different factors to represent you know the 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 velocity pressure exposure coefficient, right? So this is the um, how the uh, the the pressures are distributed as you increase in height. Um, Right, so this is you know for, for for typical boundary layer winds, right? You know, as wind speeds increase in height, we have to account for that. Uh, for tornado loads, you know, that, that that's still something that we're debating a little bit. I think that that we're, we're leaning more towards maybe just using a, a, a flat profile uh, for KZ. Um, but you know, and there's topographic effects, directionality factors, elevation factors, and so forth, right? And then we have the pressure coefficients um, um, to, in order to calculate the wind loads, right? So this would be you know wind load as a pressure, right? In, in terms of pounds per square foot or kilopascals or something. Okay, um, now. <clears throat> Something that we've been discussing quite a bit is, um, you know, it, it for, for forensic analysis, we're not as much interested in what the actual design loads were, or design parameters were, right? We want to know, you know, what was the actual load distribution that was there, not what was the design load um, uh, uh, for the structure. So uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, Bruce Ellingwood um, and a student of his uh, published a, a, a paper that looked at the relationship of the pressure coefficients in ASCE 7 um, versus what would be the actual uh, mean of that of the pressure coefficient distribution, right? That, you know, so the code is, you know, tries to be a little bit more conservative, um, and so you know, so this was trying to trying to get to and understand what is that relationship between the what is prescribed uh, to be used for design versus what what would be the actual mean. Okay, um, and so, you know, so what I have represented here, right, is you have some distribution of the pressure coefficients with a mean value, um, and but then the code is going to specify some nominal value, right, which which what they found was a little bit higher than than the mean, um, and so you know, so depending on on what on which what you were looking at, right, so I, I know Bill talked some about components and cladding. Um, versus main wind force resisting system loads, right? And they found that, um, you know, for components of cladding, th this ratio of the nominal to, of the mean over the nominal was about 95%, right? A main wind force resisting system was about 85%, right? So there was some, you know, you could almost almost like a little bit of a factor of safety, uh, right? That, that's a common term that people are, are a little more familiar with, you know, uh, built in, right? It, it, it's not it's not it's not a big um, gap there, but there 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 is a little bit of a gap, um, and so. So when we're doing these, you know, forensics analysis, because we're we're using, you know, uh, ASCE seven pressure coefficients, um, we need to account for this this difference uh, when we're looking at, at at using the full distribution, right? So we can have a slight modification then um, to the wind load equation, 
where we apply some factor here uh, uh, to 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 account for that um, that 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 reduction in the mean versus versus the nominal or specified um, factors. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then we can solve this equation for the velocity. Right again, the velocity is is what we're trying to estimate. Um, so we we can solve this equation for the velocity. Right, and so you know all these parameters here in the denominator we have values for from ASCE seven. Right, what we don't know is what is the wind load here. Right, so that's what we're trying to to find um, so that we can plug into here to estimate what the velocity might be. Okay, so again, you know we have the the reliability index here, right, which where where we can solve this for the load, right, where we can look at what, what would be the, the, the load here, right? So if we rearrange this equation to solve for the wind load, right, which we represented by L, we get this equation here, right? So you have a, the resistance by the, you know, by the square root of a ratio of their, of their uh, coefficients variation, and then this exponential term, right, that has this reliability index in here. Um, you know, so this is this is the equation that that we're this is one of the equations that we're putting into um, the standard uh, that we're developing in the forensics chapter, right? So this is this is where that equation comes from. I know that we we've, we've shown this a couple times before to some people, and that you know that they one of the comments says you know that looks complicated. We don't have any idea where that came from. So this is given a little bit of that background um, on 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 where we have uh, come up with that equation, right? So we're looking at you know using a distribution of the resistances here and a distribution of the wind load. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, about how we're uh, about how we're going to you know estimate those uh, uh, resistance distributions and then you know because we're solving for essentially the mean of the wind load um, you know we have to estimate then what is the coefficient of variation of that load right and that's that, that that's there's there's some discussion we'll have around that so um, this is a, a a table that we're putting together uh, that we're going to put into um, the appendix or the commentary um, of, of our chapter um, so this is where we have, you know, gone through the literature, gone through, um, you know, and researched to find out, you know, what are uh, resistance distributions that that, that different people have uh, have tested, have collected over over time. Um, you know, we put some references. You know, there's the Florida public hurricane loss model. Um, there's some other, you know, researchers. Um, I, I did a lot of testing on wood roof sheathing when I was in grad school that we have a paper on, you know. So there, there you know, has this has some distributions, um, right? So we, we, we've, we, you know, tried to come up with, you know, and find some of the most common building components here, at where we specified a mean value and a coefficient of variation, um, right? And again, you know, many of these um, fit a log normal distribution um, quite well. Um, you know the kind of the one uh, typical um, component that that is typically not fit with a log normal distribution is um, is 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 the uh, window glass the glazing. Um, a lot of times that is fit more typically with a Weibel distribution, um, but but most of these we can fit well with a log normal distribution, right? So this is a table that we're working on. You can see there's still a couple um, open um, uh, items that we're that we're trying to fill in. Um, now, <clears throat> you know. Another thing that we're that we're going to say, you know, is that you know you can use this table as a reference, or you can you can find your own distributions, right? If if something's not in there, you can do your own testing, or find your own research, um, or if you don't like the values in there, you you can do your own research, right? But 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 there's there's some caution that we have to have when we when we look at these component resistances, right? There, there's lots of different sources, uh, lots of different people, different institutions that have tested um, some of these components. Um, and some of them, you know, you, you look at the that the you know, two two identical or two reports from two different uh, institutions, and you know it looks like they have very very similar, um, you know, test setups or similar uh, materials they're using, but they can come up with drastically different uh, means and, and and coefficients of variation or standard deviations. Um, and some of the reasons for this could be, you know, even different loading regimes, you know. Some load monotonically increasing, you know, just at a constant rate, you know, but that rate might be different. Um, some of you step functions. Um, th this plot here on the left is is one of the test um, uh, loading regimes that we used um, when I was in grad school, right? Some use like a full, a, a more of a real time wind pressure trace. Um, 
right? In order to, you know, to, to try to simulate a more realistic wind load, right? So those, those, can, th those can have uh, differences and cause differences in what the mean distributions are. Um, the, the, the actual component, you know, material differences, right? So, you know, a lot of my research in grad school was on, was on wood framed houses, right? And, you know, one of the things that we found was, you know, differences in the species of lumber can make a big difference, right? If you have, say, you know, spruce pine fir versus southern yellow pine, right? The, the density is quite different. And so, you know, southern yellow pine is more dense. And so it actually can hold the nails into the, into the, the lumber better than southern yellow pine or, or, or spruce pine fir, right? So, you know, so those differences sometimes are not, are not quite as obvious when you first look at, 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 at different test reports. Um, you know, then, you know, fastener size, um, the, you know, laboratory versus in situ conditions, right? You know, um, laboratory, um, test data, you know, are typically tested under ideal conditions, right? You, where you have, um, uh, you've gone in and, you know, very controlled, um, you know, maybe you, you, you've let the lumber or the wood or the material age appropriately, um, or, you know, and you can, you, you've, you've made sure that all the fasteners are at the exact spacing you want, you know, right in the middle of the, of the, of the members um, and so forth. Right, but you know, in situ, you know, in the real world, these things are not um, uh, done quite to that standard, um, and so you know, so the 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 in situ components in in some cases will have lower resistances than than what you measure in a laboratory. Um, you know, aging effects um, as well uh, for certain types of materials can have a material impact in the field as well that sometimes are not properly accounted for in laboratory testing, right? You know, so again, you know, we just have to be a little bit careful when, when, we, when, we, when we, you know, estimate and look at these resistance distributions. <clears throat> okay, another um, aspect of, of, of looking at, from, from a forensic point of view to estimating these, these wind speeds is we have to look at, you know, what, what was the failure sequence, right? And we have to try to understand what was, you know, maybe the most probable or, or, or what were likely failure sequences, uh, right? So a lot of structures can have, you know, cascading failure sequences, um, you know, so once, once damage initiates um, at, at, at one point, right, that, that leads to, you know, maybe at one component fails, that can lead to failure of another component, which leads to failure of another component, um, right? So, you know, so we have to look at, again, at, you know, uh, you know, depending on the amount of damage we see and the type of damage we see, we have to, you know, try to, you know, use our engineering, you know, judgment, engineering expertise, you know, how, how we know structures, you know, typically tend to come apart um, and, and, and try to maybe, you know, back, you know, back construct what, what was maybe a likely sequence of failure, right? And sometimes you might have to estimate um, or look at more than one possible uh, failure sequence um, um, in order to, you know, in order to, to, to provide a better, uh, a better look at, at what the wind speeds will be. Um, <clears throat> so, so we talked about the resistances. Uh, now I want to talk about the load uncertainty, the wind load uncertainty in particular, right? Because the, you know, the, the what, what we're solving for here in this um, in this chapter is essentially we're trying to figure out what was the wind load that caused failure, right? And from that wind load, we can estimate the wind speed. Um, and you know, there's significant uncertainty in the wind load, um, right? So again, we have to be careful because we're using AC7 approach, right? We we have to, we we need to come up with it with an appropriate um, uncertainty or distribution um, around uh, the, the wind load. So again, you know, going back to the, 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 this Bruce Ellingwood study um, from 20 years ago, estimated that that most variables in the wind load equation in ASCE 7 have coefficients of variation of 10 to 20 percent, right? You know, so I've listed a few of them, you know, the exposure factor, the gust factor, the pressure coefficients. You know, they, they have they had different ranges that they estimated uh, um, for the coefficients of variation. Right. Um, another significant source of uncertainty was actually the exposure um, uh, category. Right. Whether I know Bill talked about this last week. Right. Whether it was you know more of an open you know uh, open exposure. Right. Where there weren't a lot of trees or a lot of buildings around, uh, versus more of a suburban and a little bit more built up or or even an urban uh, type environment. Um, right. And so that that's another source uh, of uncertainty. And so. <clears throat> You know, so where does this uncertainty come from? Um, you know, some of it comes from, you know, just the uh, the overall, you know, gustiness of the wind, right? The wind doesn't blow at a constant speed, right? It 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 varies with time. Um, it can vary pretty pretty dramatically with time. 
Um, and so, you know, nearby buildings, nearby trees, other obstacles can disturb the flow, um, you know, a, around a building, you know, whether that would be, you know, sometimes it can increase it, sometimes it can decrease it. Um, you know, the, the aerodynamic effects of a structure itself, you know, does it have sharp corners, does it have rounded corners, does it have a flat roof versus a, uh, you know, a, a, a more like a hip roof, which is a little more aerodynamic, um, you know, even the overall plan shape, is it just a square, is it, you know, an L-shaped, um, so forth. Right. And so, you know, as well as just even uncertainty in selecting those those parameters. Right. And what are the appropriate parameters, you know, including the pressure coefficients that we're using. Right. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, and so, you know, the the estimate then for the coefficient of variation of the total wind pressure um, that that's a applied to the structure um, was has been estimated to be somewhere on the order of 35 to 40 percent. Uh, right, which so it's 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 a it's it's a it's a pretty good uh, amount of uncertainty, right? But it, it's taking into account all the other uncertainties um, that 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 we're um, that we're introducing here because we're looking at at the wind loading. Okay, so so what does this look like then, right? So you know, so I wanted to give an example here and show. You know, if we work through just a simple example, what are the wind speeds uh, that we might estimate? Um, using this this procedure here okay um, so this this is a picture actually um, from south texas um, after hurricane harvey right so i'm just going to use the, 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 this this picture is just an illustration um, so this is you know just a, it was a small wood frame you know one story wood frame with, with some wood trusses um, had had some wood sheathing um, on the top and you can see that you know about half of the roof here on this side has lost this roof sheathing Okay, so we're going to look at, you know, what was the, what would be maybe the expected uh, wind speeds um, that, that 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 could have caused this roof sheathing to come off. Okay, so we're going to consider that it, there's plywood decking um, on trusses spaced 24 inches apart, um, and I'm going to look at, at two different possibilities here. So, okay, so I, I don't actually know what the nail spacing was on this, so, or what the nails were, but I'm going to uh, uh, to do look at two different um, scenarios here. So one is six penny nails. Um, spaced at a, at a what we call a 612 spacing so that's six inches on the edges and 12 inches throughout the center of the of, of the of the plywood panel right a four by eight piece of plywood um, and so you know if we look at if we take a mean resistance then of 40 uh, pounds per square foot and a coefficient of variation of 20 percent right and then let's say that though so that's, that's case one right that's, that's kind of a weaker uh, scenario if we look at case two with the stronger, so we're using eight penny nails instead of six penny nails, right? So the resistance um, can increase, you know, as much maybe up to about 100 PSF um, with a coefficient variation of 20%, okay? So if we take the, you know, some of the, the wind load parameters, right? The, you know, we're looking at, you know, if we take a KZ of, of 0.85, so this would be, um, if we're looking at kind of a, a, an open um, exposure, um, and you know the, a pressure coefficient of 1.5. So this is um, the pressure coefficient from ACE7 for a a panel that's 32 square feet, right? So four foot by eight foot, um, and um, and kind of on, along the edge of the of the building. Um, and then an internal pressure coefficient of, of 0.55. Okay. And then the other factors we've just I've just set to one here. Okay, um, so one of the things that we are still in discussions about is what is, you know, in the in the in the wind load estimation equation, what is the factor of safety or what is the probability of failure rather um, that we want to look at, right? Because if we know that the component has failed already, right, what was its probability of failure beforehand, um, right? And that's something that that we're still uh, is still under debate. But for this example, I'm I'm just going to say that we're going to assume a probability of failure of 33 to 67 percent. Right, so it kind of gets that that middle that middle third um, of that, right? So that corresponds to reliability index of 0.44. Okay, so we're going to plug this um, this into the the wind load equation um, to estimate then you know the wind speeds. Right, we're going to use a, a coefficient variation of the load of 40 percent. Right, that was you know one of the kind of the the one of the recommendations um, and estimates from the Ellingwood study. Okay, and so so based on on using these values right in this reliability index and probabilities of failure uh, we can estimate the wind speeds then right so for case one we're estimated you know 92 to 111 miles an hour 
all right, which is roughly a an EF1 um, category wind speed, right? If 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 that was if that was the, the in the case two using the eight penny nails, you know, the estimated wind speeds then are you know 146 to 176, right? So this is kind of the you know a, a strong EF3 um, category, um, right? So you know so this is you know the you know, kind of, you know, where we're trying to go, right? You know, we're, you know, using this, you know, probability, reliability, right? And trying to come up with what is what is a, a reasonable estimate of the wind speeds uh, that, that might have caused uh, that failure. Um, so I wanted to, you know, just show a little bit of the sensitivity um, of a couple of these uh, variables here. Okay, so, so the top, um, plot is for the weak case, right? So for the six penny nails and the bottom plot here is for the stronger nails. Okay. And so this is looking at, at varying the, um, the, the coefficient variation of the wind load, right? So, you know, what I used in the example was, was the black line, the 40%. Um, but if we look at, at some of the different, uh, if, if we look at, at using different ones, we can see how that uh, might vary. I've, I've drawn these lines at the 33 and, seven, and 67% probabilities of failure. Okay, so I've tabulated over here then the how those wind speed estimates uh, would vary using the different um, uh, wind load um, uh, uncertainty. Um, you can see that on on the lower wind speed estimate, uh, you know, because it actually happens to fall, you know, near where 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 this where this pivots, right? It, it, it's very similar, but you can see how the the upper estimates change a little bit as we change that uncertainty, um, you know, in in both cases here. Um, <clears throat> Then, as as a, as a second sensitivity, um, I looked at you know what if we vary the probability of failure, right? Instead of using the you know the 33 to 67, what if we went with if we went with the wider band, how would that um, change, right? And you can see, of course, it, it's a wider band of of estimated wind speeds. Or if we did a little bit narrower band, uh, you know what would that um, uh, wind speed estimate uh, look like, right? So this is um, you know again something that we're you know we're we're still debating a little bit on 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 what the probability of failure should be uh, that we that we're gonna you know that we would recommend um, to be used in the in the standard um, but this is you know a little bit of of what of what the sensitivity to to couple those parameters are um, you know of course you know if, if we vary other parameters um, you know th there there's different you know um, uh, sensitivities that we can look at you know varying the pressure coefficients or varying the 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 resistance um, uh, 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 coefficient variation and so forth um, so um, you know so that's this is essentially this is about the end of what I have um, um, I know I went through some of that uh, a little quickly uh, but I hope it gives at least some uh, background um, for you know to understand a little bit on where we're coming from when, when, when you see you know a couple of these equations show up in the standard in the proposed standard um, you'll have a little better background on where they've come from um, the commentary we're including you know I, I go through the derivation um, in the commentary of, uh, of, of that equation um, and there'll be a lot of commentary around you know some of the things we've talked about here as well um, so with that, um, we have some time uh, for some questions, so I'm I'm open if anybody has any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, remind everybody that if you have a question, you can go ahead and ask your question in the question dialog box, uh, and or use the raise your hands feature. And I see we already have a couple questions, which is great. So uh, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and open. Uh, uh, a mic up uh, to uh, David. David uh, Prevet, uh, can let's see if we can hear you. Testing one, two. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, we can hear you. Hey, Peter. Great, great presentation. I've I've been hoping my students got the chance to look at that so that I didn't have to go over all those things. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Um, what my one question was um, on slide twenty one. How did you? Uh, or oh, can you recall, can you help us understand how we relate the actual reliability index value of 0.44 there to what we have uh, typically had in, in uh, ASC 7 of a beta value of 3? Um, is it a different scale? Is this on a log scale or something? Or is there any equivalence there? So 
yeah so you're so you're um you're saying what's the how can we relate this so you're saying asce7 is you know, tries to have a, a, a reliability index of around three right yeah so right. is that that they're doing it at the ultimate level and because we're you know we're literally trying to take uh, not necessarily the ultimate wind speeds and so on that the beta level is going to be changing as we go along yeah so yeah so i mean yes yeah, so i think that's that, that's a good point right so the the ace 7 standard right that's you know again that, that's for design mm -hmm. right and so that's going to be you know tend to be a, you know a little more conservative um right and so you know so, so having a target reliability index of three right you know that that's going to give you you know probability of failure of um i can't yeah. remember you know uh, yeah you know, one to the minus four, or something like that, right? Um, so, you know, and, and that's, you know, that, that that's what's been accepted, right, as an acceptable, you know, uh, level uh, or acceptable uh, risk factor, right? For acceptable probability of failure or factor of safety almost, um, right? Whereas what we're doing here, right, and that's what I, I mentioned it a, a little bit, um, is that for forensic analysis, right, we, you know, especially where, where you know, when we go to a site and a component's already failed, right? Um, you know, um, what, what, what is that probability of failure then, right? I, you know, especially if, you know, if we know the wind speeds, you know, definitely didn't exceed 150 miles an hour, um, right? What would be, you know, but, but what we know it failed, right? What would be the acceptable or realistic actual probability of failure for that, right? Just because ASCE 7 stipulates, um, you know, a certain design load doesn't mean that in the field, the actual um, uh, resistance of that, you know, necessarily, you know, uh, yeah, equal right. that, that design load, right? And also, you know, again, you know, going back to the pressure distributions, the pressure coefficients, you know, they're going to be a little bit conservative on design, right? But, but, you know, again, that's why I talked about, you know, we have to adjust and figure out, you know, what is what would be the acceptable or uh, or appropriate mean value of the pressure coefficient, um, you know, based on the ASCE seven pressure coefficient value as well, right? So, so that's been reduced. Right, you know, so that the, the you know either the five or fifteen percent reduction um, in the in the in the nominal pressure coefficient to get to that mean of that distribution. Gotcha. Um, right, so you know, so that's what you know, and again, you know, this is um, <clears throat> like if I, right, I mean, if we look at at this plot, right, you know, here's the probability of failure, right? So you know, if you're talking about a reliability index of three, you know, you're way down here, really close to zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, if we were to if we were to do that estimate, say, with the 40 percent coefficient variation, you know, you're going to be estimating failure speeds of, you know, 109 mm -hmm. to 230 miles an hour type thing. Right. Gosh. Which yeah. which is completely unrealistic. Uh, right. And so, you know, this is this is one of the things that I've been debating a lot in my head as well. Right. I'm, you know, what is what is this acceptable range um, on, on what we should be using here? Um, you know, we were, you know, discussing, you know, is there a confidence interval that we can assign to this? You know, how, how do you relate that to a, to a reliability index, right? And that's, that, that gets tricky. Um, so. Okay, thanks much. Yep. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I'm gonna go ahead next to uh, Tom Smith and I opened up uh, your phone. Let's see if we can hear you. Hello, this is Tom. Can you hear me? Gotcha. Yes, Tom, we can hear you. So my question had to do with the, that example two slide. Could you uh, bring that up? Uh, there we go. And on that uh, external pressure coefficient of 1.5, that looks really low to me. Is that, did you assume a uh, main wind force resisting system for that pressure coefficient? Or is that a component in cladding coefficient? Um, that is a, a component in cladding um, for, you know, a 32 square foot uh, tributary area or effective wind area. Um, for um, this would be, you know, for, for a gable roof, you know, between 7 and 20 degrees. Um, for either the, the field zone or the edge zone. Right, so it's, you know, in 716, it's zone one or zone two E. Okay, so if you use components and cladding, I agree with that. It just seemed like that was a, a low value, but it's been a while since I've looked at uh, those steep slope coefficients. I know in low slope in that uh, 
certainly in the corner region, uh, 716, that's around, I think, uh, uh, 3.2. But, okay, I, I agree. If you're using components and colliding, that's good for me. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, this is one example. You know, I, I could have used, you know, a corner one, which definitely would have pushed it up, you know, to, to you know, closer to three, two and a half to three. So. All right. Thank, thank you, uh, Tom. Let's go ahead. Um, I got another question from uh, David Roosh. David, uh, can we hear you? Hi, Jim. Are you able to hear me? Yes. All right. Good. Um, Peter, again, a great presentation as well. Really enjoyed it. Very, very informative. My question to you is more general um, in regards to how this is going to fit in with the rest of the EF scale um, or the rest of the standard. Sorry. Um, so, for example, in the example that you gave here, you're looking at roof sheathing failure. Um, there would also be some other common ones for, you know, a roof to wall connection or so on. Yep. What happens when these values are different than what we have in the degrees of damage for one and two, you know, uh, family residents, for example. Um, as someone goes through and does, say, a forensic investigation of this, you know, if they're using essentially standardized values for resistances that you have in the standard or in the commentary, and you have very similar parameters for each case, you're going to end up with very similar wind speed estimates. Um, you know, determined based upon, you know, whatever exposure or height or so on. So are you going to include some discussion or have you given any thought to how, you know, if you run through the forensic analysis and it's very different from what the degree of damage, say, DOD4 is giving you, how um, how we might reconcile those or at least, you know, um, discuss it in some way? Yeah, no, th th I think that's a really great point, David. Um, so, I mean, it's something that, that we, we've thought about and discussed briefly, you know, we've still been trying to, uh, you know, make sure that we get the method down um, first, um, you know, but that, that's definitely, on, you know, one of the next big topics that we need to address. Um, so, I mean, my initial thoughts on that um, are, you know, we, we definitely need to be a little bit careful, uh, right, with that and, and, and looking at those comparisons. Um, you know, so I mean, I think, you know, I think something that that we that we need to be doing um, at some point, right, would be to, you know, to to work through a few examples, right? You know, take some real cases um, where where maybe we know some, you know, some a, a, a few specific buildings from some tornadoes. Um, you know, I, I know you have a lot of that. Dave Pravat has 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 quite a bit of that as well. Um, you know, maybe look at a few of those cases and 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 work through some of these calculations, right, and compare that back to the the degree of damage that was assigned to those i think that would be a very useful exercise um, now you know in terms of you know what if there's big discrepancies or big differences there um, i think we have to have a little bit of a discussion on what that would mean um, you know maybe maybe the the resistance um, uh, the, re the mean resistance distributions that we've used are are incorrect or um, you know there was there's something that we're missing right maybe the there were there was uh you know for instance there was some water damage that got in right and greatly weakened the you know the the members that you know caused you know failure at a much lower resistance for instance or something like to that effect right we have to we have to look and be careful um with that but i mean but that's a great point and that's something that we definitely need to spend a little bit of time um discussing and and, and coming up with a way to um, you know to compare those and reconcile those differences um, if and when I, you know I, I don't think it's probably a matter of if it's probably when they when those types of differences come up yeah well and I think one one way um, to go about that or something to consider as we move forward is um, with the existing ES scale I mean we're updating the D or the um, the di2 um, wind speeds associated with the different DODs based upon some uh, modeling that, you know, uh, Greg Kopp and ARA and myself and others are doing. So it, it may be good to at least, like you said, run through a couple of cases here with the forensics and compare them to what values we're getting with kind of the fragilities and Monte Carlo simulations and so on and and see if we are at least similar and, and try to reconcile any differences in, in kind of methodology and assumptions as we go forward, because I mean, I think ultimately, if you are using rational engineering analysis and kind of the best of our knowledge and you're getting different values from the existing DOD, I mean, I think I would know which ones I would have a little bit more confidence in. 
solution. I mean, the original duties were just kind of were you know the expert elicitation method. So I don't necessarily say all this to say that you know the the values you're showing here are incorrect. Just that you know if we can reconcile those differences as much as possible, um, I think that will be good moving forward. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Yeah, this is Jim. I, I would tend to agree. Uh, the one thing I, I get a lot um, from the weather service side of things too is actually we run into something where there is something damaged, but it's not a DI. And now suddenly I get a request. Well, what do you think the wind speeds are for something like this? And, and this is something I've fielded out, you know, numerous times. And uh, you know, this is also something I, I'm thinking of. How how can the forensic side uh, work it that would be in a standard, you know, work it way the standard would define it and so forth. So in, in those cases, even there wouldn't be any comparison to, um, you know, another method unless you had a DI immediately adjacent to it or, or something like that. Yep. Yep. Okay. So uh, let's see. I have a question from, uh, let's see, I got uh, David and Tom. And um, Mark, of course. Mark, let's see if we can hear you. Yeah, hi, Peter. That was a great uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, could you go back to the slide that had, uh, I think, the, the, that showed all the, just the, the, the overall equation that, that kind of listed all the different parameters? Um, and, uh, yeah, there, yeah, that, yeah, that, this that, one? that, yeah, that'd be good. Thanks. So in the same way that you kind of went through and showed that, okay, for the uh, GC sub P's, right, our pressure coefficients, because there's differences between design and and forensics uh, uh, factor safety, et cetera, and you talked about how we're going to deal with that. I think kind of for every parameter, we need to look at the, need to look at it through that same lens. For example, right, our elevation factor uh, that we added, and for those who don't know, so basically that accounts for uh, have you know for our, our one half rho v squared, our decreased air density at higher elevations. You know when you're in Denver, you know, air density is you know 11 or 12, 13 percent less than what it is on the coastline, and so just right there, there's a significant reduction in in the load. Now the the, the ke factor, and so that basically you, you use that based on just the elevation, the ground elevation at the building location to account for the decreased air density, which gives us, a, again, a lower velocity pressure. Having said that, the, the values that are in there are based on sort of standard atmosphere temperature pressure conditions, mm -hmm. whether it's a tornado or, I mean, um, you didn't really mention as much, but I think, believe the forensics chapter is potentially going to be applicable to um, all of the different uh, windstorm types where, where you may just have different values that you're putting in for some of these mm -hmm. parameters. But say, so for example, I mean, can we get uh, and put in, if we know specifically, I mean, from that we've got, you know, temperature data, atmospheric pressure data, et cetera, and actually calculate what that air density would be. Now, you know, in the tornado, that's going to be particularly challenging exactly how far are you from the from the core, and how much is it decreasing? But certainly, you know, we can probably come up with something better than the assumption that was put into the KE, which was sort of standard conditions. Mm -hmm. And similarly, again, you could, could kind of go through the, the details like that for 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 every single parameter uh, that we have um, in there, and we want to take a close look yep. at that. So I know you said I know you've talked about it and, and been looking into how how to deal with it for the pressure coefficients. Have you been looking at it for sort of the other range of factors? Uh, yeah, so yeah, so there, the, you know, as part of the forensics chapter, we are putting in guidance on on how to to deal with all these with all these factors, um, right? You know, so you know, and, and how does the tornadoes in particular, uh, uh, how does that change, you know, what these factors are versus what they are in ASCE seven for for more your boundary layer uh, winds, right? You know, so for instance, like the KZ value. Right, you know, there's been discussion. You know, instead of you know, maybe we'll just have you just a value, specify a value of 1.0 for all tornadoes, um, right? Instead of using the actual, you know, the variation with height that 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 you get in in ACE7. Um, 
you know, the, the elevation factor, you know, I think that's one that, um, that I think we're, we're still in discussions on, on what we're going to do about that, but, but we, we are discussing these factors and, and how we might need to modify them in, in particular for tornadoes, right? If we're looking at that versus, versus a, a, a more of a hurricane type wind. Um, so, that, I mean, the, the point is well taken, right, that we need that we definitely need to look at those. And that is something that we have been doing. We just, you know, for, for simplicity here, I wasn't I wasn't, uh, you know, necessarily accounting for all of those um, and, and putting in different factors for all of those. OK, um, the other yeah, that is something that we that we are looking at. Good, good, good. Other comment I had is like for the example that you went through a very instructive, um, but it would also be good to have some guidance. And I think we had an earlier question. I don't know if it was. Dave Bruce or someone uh, else in an early question, but you know, if we if, if we looked at and say, okay, so we, we pretty much the sheathing was removed from sort of that, that at least that whole side that we could see of mostly the close to the building. So there was some corner zones, there was some edge zones, there was some ridge yeah. zones, there was some field yeah. of the roof, and so the, the question kind of being there is, okay, which, which sort of which ones of those would give you the higher uh, load. I mean, like I said, you know, the, okay, the, yeah. it, and again, we're, we're, we're making assumptions about nailing patterns at this point. Um, but even if we continue that with, 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 in terms of assumption, the, the, the loads are different. And to, based on your assumed nailing pattern, then the, then the, the, the resistances are, 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 are different as well. So you'd, uh, at least even for an example or, or discussion, you want to think about, right, the, okay, hey, if, if we got decking removed from three or four different places, then we, uh, um, you know, would consider that. The other thing to, you know, and, and to say, okay, which one of those is going to give you the highest since it's, we've lost load, we've lost decking from multiple places. The other thing would be is what if we had that exact same house with the same picture and it lost two sheets of plywood, you know, cause you were asking about well, what probability of failure we're talking about. Okay. Well, we lost two sheets of plywood. Uh, okay, I mean, even if we look at, and I don't know in the construction industry literature and, and uh, you know, okay, even if we assume this nailing pattern and there was 50 sheets of plywood removed there, even within that 50 sheets of plywood, there's going to be different variation, right? Even the same yep. contractor put it on the same day, whatever. Some of those, you know, yeah, you had some shiners on this board, you didn't, or whatever, what, what percentage. But so would you look at, okay, if we had, if we had two sheets removed from a corner, and that would have given you, or the, or the field, or wherever that would have given you the highest number. Or we have all the sheets removed. Um, is, is that going to give us the same estimate? And and you know, I don't, I don't know. You know, and clearly in the EF, in the F scale, no, you're going to get a difference. Um, but in our forensic methodology here, how how are we going to deal with that? Yeah, actually, that 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 that's a very good question. Um, and to be honest, I think that's one we haven't we haven't thought much about yet. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I think some of it, you know, I mean, I, some of it goes back, you know, again, to looking at the failure sequence, right. And, and maybe even the failure sequence, right. Could be, you know, because sometimes, you know, you might lose some sheathing, say on an edge, right. And that can propagate through, right. And so you end up losing more sheathing in the middle, right. And, and, and you know, you have a cascading failure that way. Um, and so maybe that, yeah, I think that's a very good point that I think we, I, I'll make a note of that, that we need to think about that a little bit more um, um, and see you know, what, what, what would be the expectation in that situation? And a question on that, now, now for, and <clears throat> maybe you or Tom has a thought here or whatever, for, for certain things I can see cas cascading failure. Um, it, is one sheet of plywood coming off? I mean, again, if you're changing internal pressure and because you, you lose the wall or whatever, but let's just say, let's just say we didn't, let's just say there was no wall damage and it was just roof decking coming off. Um, um, unless you've lost some support structure underneath where, where hey if you lost this purlin or part of this truss and that was that was supporting multiple pieces of decking if you just have decking coming off um is that really a cascading necessarily i mean they're, i mean they're, they're okay when I mean, you got shingles on the top that are pulling on them and i guess you have a shingles that are nailed in and the shingle the shingle starts to pull off and that shingle spans two different sheets of plywood and I guess maybe there's some there's some there but otherwise they're pretty independent yeah um you know I don't know if the tar paper uh, you know that that risk but but even even anyway just something to, to, to think about but the other thing is so let's just say we have there's 50 sheets of plywood on the on that roof 
and one failed, I mean, you were talking about probability of failure. Well, that was the weak one. That was the one that they, they had a shiner, had a nail that, that was a little bit rotted on that board, whatever. So does that, you know, would that give us, oh, okay, we're, you know, as opposed to, you know, 40 out of the 50 sheets coming off, um, you know, does that change, uh, like I said, your, your, your kind of this desired probability? So anyway, just some, some things to think about and look forward to, to, to working through those problems. Yeah, yeah, no, I, th I think that's an excellent point that we'll have to, uh, we'll, we'll have to think about.